sticking to. I hope no one was there at the hoop night. I was dunking. That's what it was. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. How's everybody today? Man, man, it's so good to be standing here with you. The Lord is good, and uh, he is a healer. Amen. I'm so glad to be with you. I really, honestly, from my heart, feel like God has a powerful word for us. How many are ready for the word of God on today? He always has a word for us in this house. Um, so let's just open with a word of prayer. All right, let's bow our heads. God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into this place. God, we thank you for everyone who's watching online. God, we pray that your spirit would uh, be welcomed in this place. Where we, Lord, we pray over your preached word. God, that it would penetrate hearts and minds. God, we thank you that um, we will never be the same. And we praise you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we have launched our Summer of Encounter here at The Way. How many have been encountering God in a new and a fresh, a relevant way? And I don't know if anyone was here last week. Who was here last week when the Holy Ghost just walked in the room and just wiped us out? Amen? God has blessed us with a, with a powerful visitation from him. And how many people came Sunday night to our Pentecost celebration. It was mighty, right? God is really doing, can't you feel something in the air? God is, God is doing something. He's setting us on fire, all right? You guys feel the fire of God? We're going to, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about fire. And um, speaking of fire, you guys, I'm, I'm kind of old school. Anybody went to like an old school high school when you had the ghetto cheerleaders and they had like the, the, that one cheer, I'm fired up, you fired up. Yeah, anybody had that? No. Only us in the bay. Anybody had that? I'm fired up. You fired up. What? I'm fired up. Oh, you guys missed out. You were you guys. You were in Reno. Sorry. But yeah, sorry. No, that was like a high school cheer. I'm fired up. You fired up. Hey, right, hey thank you, Pastor. The, God is really in the midst of doing something. He's fire, firing us up, and you could just feel it. How many, when was the last time you've ever been genuinely fired up about something? Think about it. When were you super passionate about something? My heart is just, I've been overwhelmed by Sister Brittany and her story. That was amazing. God used her. He put a vision in her, in her mind, and she had a passion for it. What's the last thing you've been passionate about? We saw the babies up here and the graduates. We all want to do great things in our lives. You know, we, we've gen we, just the other day, how many were passionate about the Warriors finishing up this series and they <laughs> did not, <laughs> right? We praying for tomorrow. But passionate, if I were to watch you watching that game, would you have been like passionate about it? When's the last time you've been fired? You got a dream, you got an idea. You got something that you just love to do. You know, we call it like being lit. The young, the young kids like, hey, it's lit, right? Parties. Oh, it was lit. Oh, it's getting litty in here. No? Okay, no. I went too far. Went too far. Okay. It's getting lit, right? So my, my point, my, what I'm trying to do today, I'm trying to prove to you that the phrase it li it's lit originally came from the Bible. We're going to give God his credit. It's lit came from the Lord. So y'all don't believe me, we're going to see. So last week, Pastor Mike did a wonderful sermon, and it just really started this whole, I thought the Lord was so gracious to visit us the way he did as we celebrated Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit fell. And something that Pastor Mike uh, said, it just stuck with me all week. And it says, I have a slide for it. it Pastor Mike said, um, the fire will continue to burn as long as it has something to consume. The fire will continue to burn as long as it has something to consume. Think about that. I could not get that out of my head. I stuck with me all week. That as long as the fire has something to consume, it will burn. So this explains why... Um, sometimes we lose our resilience for things, right? 
Have you ever been fired up about something? Remember back to January when resolutions were rolling out? I'm fired up. I'm going to change my life. I'm going on a diet. I'm changing the way I eat. You know, we've got all these things. But what happens if you don't continue to fuel that? It kind of loses its luster, right? Things that you want to continue require some form of care. You have to put some form of energy to it. Just like your wonderful cars that you might have drove here today. Great to have a brand new car, but if you don't put gas in it, if you don't have fuel in it, your car doesn't have anything to run on. So today we're talking about fuel for fire. We've already felt the power of God. We've been talking about the fire of God. So today we're going to talk about what is the fuel for fire. Um, our verse that we're going to start off with is in Mark. Mark 3.11. Mark 3.11, if you have it in the Bibles, you can find it or you could just look on the screen. All right. Mark 3. I mean, Matthew, I'm so sorry. Matthew 3, 11. Everyone there? Um, this is John speaking. John said, um, I will baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He, somebody said he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and what? We're talking about fuel for fire. So let, just let's just look at this verse for a minute. He said he's going to baptize you. Baptize, baptism, it means to be fully immersed. Remember when we have our, our whole thing here? Be fully dunked, which also equals a full surrender. Can you imagine if Pastor Mike tries to baptize somebody and they just won't go down? And it's like, <laughs> we, we're trying to get you go and they just won't. Would that technically be a baptism? Like, what just happened here? Or even like a cannon. Anybody ever did a cannonball into a pool? Like, you can't have cannonball. Like, you're either all in or you're not. Like, you have to jump all in. This is this, this immersion God is talking about. Jesus said, think about this. He will baptize you with fire. With fire. A full immersion. A full surrender. You're all in. Right? So let's just review real quick. Last week was the day of Pentecost. Our previous, um, what we talked about last week. But I want to show you in Acts 2, 1 through 4, how the verse we just saw was fulfilled. It says, and when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a a sound from heaven. There came from heaven a sound like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. This was the day of Pentecost. And if you, if you would just humor me for a little bit, the Pentecost was the day that the pilot light was lit. All right? It was the day the pilot light was lit. How many of you ever had a house? with a water heater or a gas stove. Remember, I currently live in an apartment, so I don't have those problems. But anybody still have a house with a fire? Anybody had one that was broken? Let's talk about that. You ever had a water heater that was broken? And what you have to do every time you want to take a shower or wash the dishes? You had to go in there. Some of y'all had old school with the newspaper, crumble it up, get the fire off the stove, and go in there, right? You had to light the water. You had to light the pilot. And you know, if you want hot water, if you want to use it, ever had a gas stove and that one little light go out, and you just lost. Hey, it's, just, it's just hissing. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Or we got all, all electric now. Y'all know these problems. But the only way it would work is if that pilot light stayed lit. Now, can you cook? Or heat water from your home with just the pilot light? Think about it. With that one little light that's burning in the back of your gas stove, could you make a whole meal off that? With the pilot light just running in your garage, could you heat your whole, the, all the water in your home from just the one little pilot light? 
You can't do it with just that one light. What happens is whenever the heat is needed, whenever the fire is needed, it gets turned up when it's needed, right? Your pilot light's steady burning, but when you need more heat, more fire, more, you got to turn it up. The only way fire remains is if it's maintained. The only way fire remains if it's, if it's maintained. So we're going back to the day of Pentecost. That's when we celebrated when the Holy Spirit came on the earth to finally dwell in us. He lit the pilot light. So that's great. But there's a responsibility that comes with fire. Once we receive the fire of God, it is our responsibility to maintain it. We're talking about fuel for fire. So I'm going to give you an example from the Old Testament. Then we're going to bring it home. I promise this won't even be long. In the Old Testament, here's an example of fire maintenance. Are you guys there with me? It's from Leviticus. This is very interesting because back then, all they had was a tabernacle. The tabernacle is where God had church in the wilderness, right? If you remember, you had to make all specified things. And this is where all the offerings and the sacrifices, because this was the only way people could talk to God is if you had these sacrifices to kind of cover up your sins temporarily. So God had all these um, ways that he wanted to go about it. And he had something specific about the fire. Look at Leviticus 6, 13. And when he came to the, to the fire and the altar and the sacrifices, he said about three times in this verse. By the way, you can write these things down, take notes, look at the scriptures later. Read them for yourself. Don't just take my word for them. Um, he said, keep the fire shall keep, be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. He said about three times in the same verse, keep the fire burning on the altar. How long? How many times? Continually. It shall not go out. And then he did something amazing. After he told everybody what to do in Leviticus 9, you should really read this for yourself. In verse 24, God did this miraculous thing. Fire came from heaven, and it lit the fire in the tabernacle. It lit the fire in the tabernacle. It did not come from earth. But it came from heaven, which means that you can't manufacture this fire. This this fire that God wants to put inside of you, it does not come from earth. It does not come from your own intellect. It does not come from your own dreams and vision. It has to come from heaven. He lit the fire. He was the first one that said, it's lit. Come on. It's lit. It's lit. First one. I'm going to give God his props on the day. Y'all thought y'all was doing something going to parties. No. Y'all copied. He lit it. But he had, a, he had a instructions that came with it. Once I light it, it's up to you to maintain it. Continually, and it shall not go out. All right? Fire will burn as long as it has something to consume. So think about your spiritual life now. Every time you pray, it's like putting another log on the fire. Every time you worship, you keeping that fire lit. Come on, you guys know we've been camping. Anybody can camp? I know we're like urban now. But you guys remember camping and campfires? Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, right? Or even just backyard barbecues. You got a you got a fire going. What happens if you just don't just ignore the fire? You're trying to cook steaks and you got stuff. You got s'mores going on. You got a great fire at first, and everybody just goes and talks and do their own thing. The fire dies. You have to keep doing something. You have to keep going back in the woods and getting wood and chopping it and putting it back on. You have to keep putting coals and lighter fluid. You have to keep the fire going. Why do we feel that these things are correct in the natural, but we don't have to do these same things in the spiritual? This makes perfect sense when we go camping. 
But when it comes to our spiritual life, when God lights that fire inside of you, he's giving you a passion for something. God wants to light that inside of you. He's giving you dreams and visions. He's giving you a heart. He's giving you a calling. He's telling you what he wants you to do. It takes his fire. You got to add God's fire to it. And once you receive that fire, you got to keep it going. Now let's get to the New Testament. What fuels God's fire? What fuels God's fire? I think I already heard it. Somebody said it's prayer. Prayer is the one thing that will fuel the fire that you feel inside. Have you ever felt on fire for God? Have you ever been there before? Maybe you just started a new church. You just came here for the first time. You read the Bible. You're like, this is amazing, right? You get on fire. Everybody you meet, like, oh, I just came from church. Oh, you should join my church. You should look at us online. God is good. You know, people cutting you off. You're like, praise the Lord. I never do that, so it must be God. You're on fire for God. This is something you, right? When we're on fire, but something has to fuel that. Or in a couple of weeks, you're going to be back to cussing everybody out who, who cuts you off on the freeway and you're mad and you don't understand what's going on. Something, we've all been juiced for God. And then you holler at us in a month or so and it's like, uh, yeah, I don't know when I've been to church last, you know? Why? Because it requires fuel to burn what God puts on the inside of you. And even now as I'm speaking... Someone is feeling the fire of God rekindle in their hearts. I know you can feel it. You feel the fire of God burning back. He's lighting that pilot light again. He says, in, if, if, if prayer is the fuel, Ephesians 6.18. I'll go to the second. Ephesians 6.18 says um, to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. It says on all occasions to pray in the spirit continually. You're always praying, always praying. This is the one thing that will keep your fire lit. Now, this is where we kind of rear off because you think about prayer. You're like, oh, prayer. Boring. You know, like. Okay, I'll get out my little prayer book or something and just find some prayers on the internet. I don't know what to do. About five minutes in, I'm out, right? You're like, I'm asleep. I don't know what to say. How am I going to get this fire going when I really, hmm, prayer's not my thing, right? But this is what, what I want to get to today. The prayer I'm talking about is not some religious, traditional kind of prayer that we're just chanting and we just got to say the same thing. And uh, I said this last time, the same prayer I always pray. And there's no really heart to it. It's just like you're just kind of doing it to check it off your list. Like, all right, prayer, check. On to the rest of my day, right? The prayer I'm talking about is a, a prayer that's motivated from the love that you have for God. And if you've been going to our small groups, we started our, our House of Fire, our House of Prayer. Ooh, House of Fires. Yeah, yeah. Next series. <laughs> House of Prayer this week. And that was the main focus of really getting in a relationship with God where your prayer is motivated just simply from your love from him. And not from duty, not because I have to, not because I should. But genuinely, Lord, I just love you. I just want to talk to you. I just want to be with you. I just, nothing feels right if I don't just spend, like, some time with you. Like, Lord, I just want to love you, right? That's the prayer I'm talking about. That is the prayer that fuels your passion. Amen? So, God, you got to know this. And you have to believe me. And you have to read the word to know. God will send fire when you pray. You got to know this. You got to believe it. God will send fire. Why? How do I know this? Well, in Hebrews 12, 29, it says that our God is a consuming fire. Think about the God you serve. He's consuming. Our God is a consuming fire. Yes, God is love, but he is also a whoo. He a bad boy, too. He's a consuming fire. Do you know what a consuming fire is? It's not like a little... Oh, wood fire. It's not like a little cute campfire. It's a wildfire. It's a consuming. It will burn up everything 
in its place, in its path. It will take everything. It, it, it takes up everything. It don't spare you nothing. Consuming, I, I want it all. When you consume, when you're consumed, that's what God is. A consume. He wants it all. He ain't leaving nothing. You, you want to fool with God? You want him to be this fire? You better be ready because he wants it all. A cons- you can't control a, fi- a, a, a real, a crazy fire. You can't control a crazy fire. God is a consuming fire. And what else? Our God answers by fire. I don't know if you remember the, the story of Elijah in 1 Kings. And they went against each other. And God was like, okay, well, the God who's real God, he's going to be the one that answers by fire. And God sent fire from heaven. He, they, they stacked up all the odds. I don't want to get too much in the story, but you guys should really read this. It's in Kings, Kings 18. They, put, we're, they had this battle going on, and Elijah was so confident in God. He's like, go ahead, wet my fire. Like, he had a, all kind of uh, stuff and animals. He's like, drench it. Put water on it. Well, I don't care. Put a heck of water on it. The God who's real will answer by fire. And God came, and he burnt up everything that was, that was on that altar, just like he wants to burn up everything in our lives. Our God is a consuming fire. Now, you might be like, okay, that's nice. That's cute. But where, you know, who, where can I reference this? I got to tell you really quick about this story of a guy named Cornelius in the Bible. Cornelius is located in Acts 10. One and two. Um, I'm just going to give you the condensed version because we'll be here till the Warriors game if I went to went to the whole story. But the story of Cornelius. Cornelius. Cornelius was an excellent guy. Okay, I'm looking this way. Um, it says at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as an Italian co- co- cohort. Why can't I say that? Cohort. A devout man who feared God with his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed. When, how, how much did he pray? There's a theme persisting. He prayed continually to God. Let me give you background about this guy, Cornelius. He was a Gentile. So at this point at the book of Acts, the disciples were convinced that even though Jesus had risen from the dead and they're going out and preaching and everything, they were convinced that this whole little deal about Christianity Christianity was just for Jews. Like, this is just for us. Like, Jesus came for us to save us, and this is just for us. So we're just going to go to the little temples, and we're going to tell everybody about Jesus, this new thing that we found. Well, this guy Cornelius comes up. He's a Gentile. Raise your hand if you're a Gentile. This is always a trick question. If you're like, I don't, I don't, am I a Gentile? Yes, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. Congratulations. So if you're, so he was there. He was a Gentile. He, he's a, an Italian regiment. He was a satirian. He had a good job. But there was something special about him. He still was seeking God, even though he wasn't Jewish. He just knew it was something more. He just knew there was a God out there, and he would, he would pray to him. He would um, give tithes and offerings. He, would just, he was just a great guy. And then it goes in the story, you can read it for yourself in Acts 10, that an angel appears to him. He's like, hey, I want you to send your dudes to go get Peter. I'm going to give you the ghetto version. To send, your, send your people to go get Peter. Peter, at the same time, is having this crazy vision about all kind of animals and pigs and shrimp and, and pig's feet and oxtail, all kind of stuff, bacon that he wasn't supposed to eat. And God was like, go ahead, Peter, go have some lunch. Peter's like, I don't eat. I, I'm, a Jew. I'm kosher. I don't eat that. And God kept saying, hey, don't call what, what's clean, what, what I've called clean, don't call it unclean. He kept telling him, he's like, what a weird dream. Maybe I'm hungry. So then uh, Cornelius... <laughs> came to him. It was like, they sent their guys, like, hey, can you come back with us? He went back to Cornelius' house, which was a big no-no, because Jewish people did not associate with Gentiles, nor were you supposed to go into their houses, nor were you supposed to eat with them. And Peter did all of the above, because he heard a word from God that said, don't call what I've called clean, unclean. So he goes in the house, 
And something amazing happens in that house. Peter begins to tell them about, I love Cornelius, go to the story. He brought all his family, his friends, he got them all in there. And as Peter was preaching, they were like, Peter, just tell us what you know, tell us. He was preaching about Jesus, and as he was saying the words, the Holy Spirit fell on all who were in the house. These are Gentiles, and they received the Holy Spirit. Blew the Jews' mind. What? This is just, just not just for us? This is for, oh, this is for, oh, this is for everybody. Oh, okay. How many glad it's for everybody? If you're a Gentile, you better wave your hand in the air. Wave it like you just don't care. Because it's for everybody. Praise God. We need to do more for Brother Cornelius. He's amazing. He's the one, because of his prayers, he made a way. You got to hear Peter's testimony about this. I'm on Acts 11, 15. So the Jews hemmed him up. They were like, yo, we heard you was at the Gentiles' houses eating and the whatnot. It's in there. You guys should really read this. It's really a great story. This is Peter's testimony. He had to tell him. He's like, and uh, he's telling him the recanting the story. As I begin to speak, he was telling them about Jesus. The Holy Spirit fell on them just as we, uh, on, 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 on us as at the beginning. Remember Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost fell, first, fell, first fell. He was like, that happened. It happened just like it happened to us. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, what did he say? John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember the verse we first read? He referenced back to the verse that we first read when we first started. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? When they heard this, they fell silent. God will silence your critics. <laughs> and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. How many were grateful for it? How many grateful? So that the moral of this story is because you got to see from Cornelius' life. Prayer will open doors for God to do way more than you ever dreamed or expected. See, Cornelius was just praying. He just felt like, man, I just love God. It was a love-motivated prayer. It wasn't a checklist. I just love God. I'm just going to pray as much as I can. It's just going to come out of my heart. I just, I just love him. But when he did it, who knew that he would open the door that he would be the first, the first person that the Holy Spirit would use to get us all in this place. Just from praying. Just from a prayer. Just from, not just a prayer, from continual prayer. Can you imagine what God can do in your life? Things you haven't even thought of. Things that you haven't even imagined. I want you to reimagine that. Tap into that. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think but it comes from a prayer life also prayer keeps the fire lit and allows you to have the power to turn it on whenever it's needed you're going through a rough patch guess what the holy spirit will do he'll turn up what you need for what when you need it you're going through some sorrow you're going to a hard time you're going through tribulation you need that fire to turn up in the instances that you need him, or you're just going to be operating on a pilot light that really is not very effective. Amen? Amen? All right, three points and we're out of here. What does the fire bring into our lives? What does the fire bring to our lives? There's three points. Number one, the fire of God will bring the presence of God. If you remember back in Numbers um, when the children of Israel were coming out of, the, um, out of Egypt, God sent a pillar of fire to guide them at night and a cloud by day. This fiery presence provided light and guidance. God will give you light and guidance in your life. Fire not only fuels, but it lights. How many have been in some dark places? 
You've been thrown through some dark things. Well, guess what? You need the fire of God. The fire of God will guide you. He will tell you where you need. He will bring the presence. And then also in 1 Corinthians, it says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the most amazing thing because back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit just came in instances. And he just came upon people, and then he would go away. He would come up people, and they would do great things and fight an army, and then he would go away. But ever since that day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit now dwells inside of you. It's a miracle. He never leaves. He lives in you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is very ironic because remember the temple back where we talked about the tabernacle? Remember the tabernacle where God sent the fire? Well, guess what? We don't need tabernacles anymore because you are the temple. He doesn't need to dwell in tents and all that. He wants to dwell in you. And guess what? The same command still applies to you. Do not let the fire go out. In your temple, when God sends the fire from heaven that cannot be manufactured by earth, it is up to you to keep the fire going. Number two, what does the fire bring? It brings passion. If our church ever needed anything today, if our world, we need passionate people. We've seen from our sister Brittany a passion, a passion that made her move across the world to change life. That, that's, not, that's not fueled on anything. That's fueled on a passion. The Holy Spirit creates the passion of God in our heart. Have you just ever wanted more? Have you just walked in and been like, it has to be more to this? It has to be more than just coming to church and sitting down and singing some song and getting going home and maybe reading it. There has to, have your heart ever cried out for more? God, there's got to be more. And if to that prayer, God wants to say, I, I want to give you more. I want to give you a passion like you've never known. Remember back in the road to Emmaus on Luke uh, 24 and 32, when the disciples who were walking and they met the resurrected Jesus, after they talked to him, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Have you ever felt a supernatural burning inside when you heard the word of God preach? Have you ever felt a burning inside when you read the word of God and it is exactly what you needed for that day? That's from the Lord. That is your passion. God wants to give you a passion like never before. And then he also wants to give you a boldness in Acts 4 and 31. It says that the disciples received a boldness from God, a holy boldness, even in the midst of persecution. And how many people know we need the boldness of God? We need to stop being scared to, hey, I'm a Christian. No, it, it, what God will do, he won't even, you, we try to manufacture it and be like, well, here's my spill about who I am. No, God will enable you to live boldly. To speak boldly, where it's not just something you say, but it's something you live. And when a situation comes up, you're not scared. You say it. You say what needs to be said. You have a voice in the Holy Ghost, right? How many people want the passion of God burning in their soul? The third thing he will do, he will bring purity. This is what the fire does. The Holy Spirit is our agent of sanctification. This is in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. This is the Holy Spirit's work to set us apart from sin, consecrate us, make us holy. And he is the one who is conforming us into the image of Christ. That is the Holy Spirit's job. So you thought that was your job. I got to be right. I got to get better. I got to do more. I got to stop doing this and I got to cut this out. Well, that's, that's great. But that's not your job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to make you more like Christ. Have you, has anyone ever experienced that before? When you just stop doing stuff and you don't even know why you stopped and you just answer stuff differently, like, I don't even know where that came from. And you just went and, like, who was this? People are like, is that you, girl? I would have known last time, a month ago, she would have got it. You're like, I know, I don't even where did that come from? Right? When you let the Holy Spirit work in you. And this is the, this is the thing. In Psalm 66, 10, 
It says, for you, O God, tested us. You've refined us like silver. Check this out. A sil- as a silversmith uses fire to purge the dross, all the, the impure stuff from precious metals, so the Lord uses the spirit to remove our sins from us. His fire cleanses and refines. This is the part. This is the part of the fire we really don't, we're not interested in. We're like, yes, Lord, send the fire. <laughs> and then he started burning up stuff that you want to hold on to. You're like, no, wait, not that. Wait. I don't know if anybody ever been in a house fire, but you want to go back and get stuff like, oh, I forgot my pictures. And you run back in the house. You're trying to get stuff out of a burning house. It's kind of how we are with our lives. God's putting stuff on fire. Nope, got to go. It's a fire sale. It's all going up. Wait. My, my phone book, you know, like, wait. My pity. He wants to burn up. Pastor Mike said this so good last, last, last Sunday. That God wants to burn, burn up these things in our life. The Holy Spirit will burn up everything that's not like him. And he will set on fire everything that needs to stay. Can I say it one more time? The Holy Spirit will burn up everything that's not like him. Everything that's in your life that, that's not like him, he'll burn it away. But then he'll set on fire everything that needs to stay. He'll set it on fire. He'll put a passion in your heart. He'll give you power. He'll give you power to do it. So how? How do I receive this fire? And we're closing. You might be sitting here like, okay, this is nice. Okay, great. Fire. Got it. How do I receive this fire? The first thing you have to do, you have to put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Because remember our first verse? He's the baptizer. It is he, he says, John said, he's going to come and baptize you with fire. That's Jesus' job. Jesus is the baptizer. Isn't that amazing? He's the one that baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But if you've never trusted him, if you never let him into your life, if you never say yes to him, if you've never made a decision to ask Jesus into your life, you're, you're disqualified for this fire. You're not able to receive this. This is something that only Jesus can give. So that's your first step. Put your trust in Jesus. The next thing, how do I receive this fire? Don't try to control the fire. Stop trying to mess with the setting, the control settings on this fire. So we try to use the Holy Spirit like a heater on the wall. Um, yeah, I just want, I'm a little cold. I need fire. And then it gets a little hot, like, okay, that's enough, Jesus. That's enough. I'm turning it down. I don't want it anymore, right? We try to control the settings of what's doing. God's trying to burn things. You're like, God, take it out, burn it away. And he starts really doing it. Like, no, never mind. Turn it down. We're trying to control the way God said. But you, God, do you know that God wants to do this crazy? Will you just let God unleash a wildfire in your life? Will you just let him unleash Will you just imagine a wildfire? Will you just let him just let him burn through your life everything that doesn't need to be there? Will you trust him to do that? The next thing, how do you receive this? Well, you can only receive this fire through community. A burning log alone does not last. We set a little log. We, we say we're going to have a campfire out in the back. We put, set one little log, one little third flame on fire, and we just kind of leave it there for an hour. That little thing is just going to go out. But with many logs, the fire burns greatly. So we can't do this alone. It happens here. It happens when you walk in this building. It happens in live groups. Go online. Log on to thewayberkeley.com. Find a house of prayer near you. Go and find other logs to be in. We have prayer here on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. We have prayer here on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Come. Come. 
Don't just be a log trying to burn by yourself, wondering why you can't catch fire, wondering why your heart is cold, wondering why you're not on fire, wondering why you're not passionate, wondering why I can't feel what everybody else is feeling. Well, you know, you're all here alone, burning, burning man, alone. The next thing, if you want to receive this fire, all you have to do is just ask. You just ask. That's the wonderful thing about our God. He doesn't make us do hoops and tricks and run them around the block five times and do, do a black flip and then come and then walk old ladies across the street. He doesn't, he doesn't, even, he doesn't even require. It's not even complicated. And a lot of us have been in settings where, you know, things and talks about the Holy Spirit has been very complicated. I mean, it's been very, you know, a lot. But all you have to do is just say, Lord, just, just fill me with your Holy Spirit. Just fill me. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, listen to this verse. Jesus said, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's his good pleasure to fill you. It's what Jesus died for. That you don't have to go do sacrifices and goats and that he doesn't have to come in, but he wants to live in you. It's his pleasure. It's his joy. And this is our last point. You want to receive the fire of the Holy Spirit? Be continually filled. You have to be continually filled. It's not a one-time thing. Just like you can't just drink one glass of water to last you for your lifetime. I can't just drink one glass of water and say I'm good for life. Need, I don't need any more water. Same in your spiritual life. Can't just be filled once and be like, that was great. I felt tingles and butterflies in church. I'm good. No, it's a continual feeling. It's a continual asking. It's a continual watering. You know, everybody got plants at home. You can't just not water the little plants. You got to continually do it. Same with the Holy Spirit. This is our last verse. Listen to this. John 7. Jesus said, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried, anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his belly, will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not glorified. But guess what? Jesus has been glorified. He has been risen. The Spirit has been sent. The pilot light has been lit. And it's available for you. It's a supernatural life. It's not a bunch of hoopla. It's a real simple thing. God, just fill me with your Spirit. And then allow him to be that fire and let him do whatever he wants to do in your life. It's a full surrender. So let's have everyone stand.